Hello there, Alaskans, wherever you are. Welcome to the Must Read Alaska Show. Coming to you from somewhere in Alaska. This is the place where we talk about, you guessed it, Alaska. Where we keep the mainstream media on their toes and where we are standing up for what's right and a world run by leftists. You can find out more by heading over to mustreadalaska.com and also checking out the Must Read Alaska YouTube channel for some really great content. But first, let's get this party started. Well, it's good, Alaska. This is Scott Levesque, and you're listening to the midweek edition of the Must Read Alaska podcast. Well, I want to welcome everybody. Thank you for joining me early this morning on a Thursday. I'm very excited to be here with you, and we've got a lot to break down. But before we get into any of that, let's just take a moment, and if you could, give us a five-star review. It really helps with people searching for the podcast, people searching keywords for the podcast. It's just a massive help. If you could do that, that would be phenomenal. And again, if you want to take it just one step further, you can leave us a written review. We love hearing from our listeners. We really appreciate it. It's been an incredibly positive Uh, feedback from you guys, and we do appreciate hearing from you. So if you could just take a minute before you continue on with this podcast and give us a five-star review and and possibly a written review, that would be phenomenal. Well, we are in it right now. We're in the midst of receiving and voting for the mayor of Anchorage. That is happening as we currently speak. Uh, I have already received my ballot, filled it out, and returned it. So uh, again, Before we move any further, I cannot tell you how important it is. If you want change in Anchorage, you need to vote. I don't care if you stop after this little lecture here, but you need to vote. Now is not the time to hold yourself to principles about how many candidates or the fact that there may be a runoff or the fact that there are too many liberal or conservative candidates. It does not matter. At this point, you need to vote and let the chips fall where they may. And if we do have a runoff, then vote again. This is something that I I know, statistically speaking, conservatives have been terrible at. They vote once, and if there's a runoff, they do not vote the second time. I am telling you, doing that would be disastrous. By all means, right now, uh, statistically speaking, it looks like it'll probably be Forrest Dunbar and Dave Bronson in a runoff. Regardless, it's important that if that happens, or if any other candidates You could swap anybody in and out, end up being a part of that runoff. It is important that you vote a second time. I am telling you, it is beyond imperative that you do that. Well, let's get into some of this. Listen, if you haven't listened to the Monday edition or the Monday slash Tuesday, because it goes in Monday afternoon and most people download it on Tuesday morning, uh, Suzanne Downing had Russell Biggs on, uh, and Russell is the co-founder of Recall Rivera, and uh, I believe Reclaim Midtown. He's also a part of that group as well. A fascinating listen when it comes to what's going on in that recall effort. And one of the things I want to make people very clear of is, is how the recall effort got through and why that was such a big deal. If you remember back to AO66, and again, that's the purchasing of uh, what we're calling the hotels. But different real estate around and specifically in Midtown for uh, the homeless, uh, drug addicts, um, individuals who are, you know, who, who need um, a variety of different services that now the city, the municipality was going to take on as part of their portfolio as, um, I don't know, caretakers of the city. I'm not quite sure. Now, during that time, the, the actual assembly chambers were closed. And while they were closed, the law was is that you couldn't have a specific number of people above, I, I don't know if it was 16 or 15. It was something in there. Uh, and so during the deliberations for AO66, that, that, quote, law was in effect. And so nobody from the public was allowed to give public testimony. Well, except for one individual, Mike Abbott, who is the executive director of the Alaska Mental Health Trust. Now, this is not a problem for Mike. Mike was invited to come in to give expert testimony. The problem is, is that when Mike entered that chamber, it violated the emergency order from Berkowitz, which technically broke the law. And when when confronted with this, 
by Assemblywoman Jamie Allard. It was completely ignored by Rivera. And again, Abbott just continued on with his testimony. The problem with that is this. Listen, this is a classic example of do as I say, not as I do. Okay? And that has been the mantra of this assembly for most of at least my years here. Since the assembly really took a turn uh, towards the left side of politics, it's been do as I say, not as I do. And that's been a continual theme throughout the assembly's tenure. And the problem with that is this. The problem with that is you get stuff like this that happens. There's nobody to blame for this, for the recall for Rivera, except for himself. When asked and, and presented with the fact that this was a violation of the emergency order, Rivera, and and again, if you remember this, it was sort of very dismissive by Rivera. Yeah, whatever. This is, you know, it, it was brushed off as no big deal. Well, that was the precipice of why this recall effort was actually able to go through. Because it was a violation of the emergency order, and by ex- was a violation of the emergency order, and by extension, the law. So here we go. And throughout this process, the recall Rivera process, there has been a lot of accusations flying from the keep Rivera side that have been just absolutely preposterous from science, from trying to make this um, an LGBTQ issue instead of what it really was, which is a policy issue. And the fact that there was a complete and utter uh, dismissal of law and emergency order. So... When we look back at this, regardless of the outcome, keep in mind, is, is, and I always ask this, is this a moment where individuals and in, in policy and party look at this as a warning sign or do they look at this as just a stumbling block? And that's where we're at right now with Rivera. Does he recognize this as a warning sign? Like, hey, I need to shape it up. Can't just be doing whatever I want. Can't be telling people to do things. Can't be telling people these are our emergency orders. Can't be uh, enforcing these emergency orders with, um, I forgot what they're called, code enforcers. But at the same time, violating them publicly, even when confronted by a peer about it and dismissing it. It's amazing. Again, it is just absolutely amazing when you look at this from a, a surface level of view how much this is, or or at least the, the recall effort can be placed at the feet of the person who's being recalled. And yet, once again, the almost adolescent response to this has been, it's everything except for what the real issue is. It's they don't like LGBTQ people. Not the case. It's they don't believe in science. Have no idea why that's even a, an argument. And the reality is, is until we start acting like mature adults, we're going to get immature responses. And that's just the case. And it's too bad because, uh, once again, this could have been, I mean, Rivera could have easily just said, you know what, you're right. Uh, we need one person to leave or you know, we can't have this expert testimony. I mean, he could have done a numerous, he, he had options. Let's just put that. He had options and chose, in, in what I would consider, arrogance. To just say, nah, I'm good. We're going to do what I want. I'm the chair here. And that's what it feels like. Whether or not that was the intent, I don't know. But the the actual violation by him is is on him. It's not on Jamie Allard. It's not on Save Anchorage. It's not on any of that. It's on Felix Rivera. Well, that brings us to really our next uh, our next topic today, which is Again, this is fascinating. Anchorage is is really at a at a unique spot because it's starting to see a lot of what the lower forty eight is experiencing across the nation right now, which is sort of this narrative setup, this idea that people we have uh, we have sort of mercenary journalism going on, where individuals from you know larger uh, whether they're websites or whether they're actual um, traditional media are getting involved in in politics and policy from a distance. And right now we have that happening here in Anchorage. And so a group uh, from from San Francisco called The Appeal, it's an online quote newspaper uh, that's funded very much by left-leaning um, individuals 
some of those include uh, the Mark Zuckerberg's wife is one of those. Uh, there's a lot of other left-leaning organizations that continually fund um, fund this group, the appeal. And, and really what I want to talk about is the fact that there was sort of this hit piece slash uh, connection here with the Save Anchorage group. Uh, there's been a lot of stuff that's come out of Save Anchorage. Now, keep in mind, this group is extremely large. Uh, it's I, I don't have the exact numbers right now. I can look them up as I'm talking. But the Save Anchorage group is, is well over 9,000, I believe, individuals that are in the group itself. Uh, not all of them are participants. It's an open group. And anybody can join. And when anybody can join, there's obviously you know, a propensity for people to get in there and, and I guess for lack of a better term, uh, leak information out to other individuals. Now, there's 86, over 8,600 people in this group, okay? So let me just give you the, the correct analysis. There's over 8,600 people in this group. And so you're bound with 8,600 people on a digital virtual group to have bad, bad eggs in there. Uh, but... But what we're seeing now is that Save Anchorage is used to, is being politicized by the left and specifically Forrest Dunbar to show a correlation between this group and Dave Bronson, to show a correlation between this group and Mike Robbins, and to paint this group as a right-wing nut job group that their only focus is uh, providing radical and uh, extreme right-wing solutions. Again, it's a narrative setup here. And what's more concerning, more than anything else, is that Forrest Dunbar specifically, and it seems like this. Listen, I can't, I can't, I can't directly tie Forrest to this, but Forrest is written throughout. His name comes in to this article numerous times, numerous times, and unfortunately. Uh, it's really hard to separate the fact that it seems like Force Team contacted this group and said, hey, we have a story. We've got a left, very left-leaning mayor candidate in a tight race, and we need to distinguish ourselves. So can you do an article on Forrest and also the fact that this, in their words, extreme right-wing group who's tied to Dave Bronson and Mike Robbins is supporting extreme right-wing, uh, for lack of a better term, crazy candidates. So here's, here's just a snippet from this, this, uh, this article, which again, you, if, if anybody was trying to keep this, that Forrest team was, was, re, had reached out, um, it, they did a terrible job. Forrest is all in this, and I'll give you an example here from an excerpt. A reporter from The Appeal in San Francisco interviewed Dunbar, and characterized him as worried about Save Anchorage, which organized last year after a series of radical decisions to shut down the city's businesses, purchase hotels for vagrants, and ban a practice called conversion therapy, in quotes. Save Anchorage was a constant presence at protests during the fall, excuse me, during the summer, fall, and winter at assembly meetings as members tied, tried to save the city's economy. Not too bad, right? The problem is, is that that actually wasn't an excerpt. That was Suzanne Downing who wrote the story. So here's one. Here's an actual excerpt, and this is just one line. At the same time that Anchorage's fringe right-wing groups have been organizing, the city's Democratic Party have been falling apart, wrote The Appeal. So there's this, listen, when, when, when these left-wing outlets, right, there, there is a strata, there is a layered system to this writing. On the outside, the appeal is this. Forrest, who's all through this, is very concerned. So there's an empathy appeal appeal to this candidate. Also, there's a there's a lens that's being portrayed here that Save Anchorage is a left-wing nut radical group who has again only certain specific um, agendas in mind, right? Only certain specific agendas. Uh, not the fact that that, you know, 
they're trying to save the economy and that they have they have legitimate gripes about the way that policy and politics and the assembly and the emergency orders and the um, whether it was the previous Berkowitz or acting mayor administration has been handling things. No, no, no. They're just left wing or excuse me, right wing nut jobs. Of course, that makes sense. Always. But there's certain level of strata here. Yes. The main objective is to paint, save Anchorage. And then underneath that, Dave Bronson and Mike Robbins as one and the same. To try to make them look like they are uh, angry about helping homeless, that they're trying to uh, impose conversion therapy in quotes here, uh, that they're um, angry at the wrong people, all this. And then you add on top of that local press, like the Anchorage um, a lot of these local press here in Anchorage, whether they're blogs or whatnot, I'm not going to mention them. They don't deserve, uh, they don't deserve to be mentioned. But they're also a part of this as well, pushing this narrative. It's a coordinated effort. I'll give it to the the left. They will compromise um, their own goals for the goals of the greater good of the party, if you will. Which has always been my gripe at some level with. Uh, conservatives. Conservatives never, they listen, they are free-thinking, independent people. The problem with that is, is that then you get a, a bit of a mess because everybody believes their idea is the right one, whereas on the left, man, they will follow lock and step, and the coordination and the effort in doing so is pretty incredible. So you have local blogs, you have national, well-funded, left-leaning uh, online outlets providing uh, a narrative, and now you have Forrest sort of as the darling child in the middle of this, uh, looking at it as the uh, the narrative in this one is that, hey, he's the savior. He's the guy that's for the job. He's the guy for the job. Economics, the issues of economics and shutting down the economy of the city, that's not on Forrest. The fact that we have people who are angry because of policy, that's not on Forrest. The fact that people feel like that the assembly, and by extension there, the, the current administration, is diving head deep into personal liberty and freedom within the home and within raising your kids, that's on a forest. Forest number had nothing to do with that. The problem is, is that forest number has everything to do with that. He's been on the assembly. He's been there. He's voted. He's tried to pass the most liberal legislation and tried to impose policy that directly impacts an individual family. He has tried to impose policy that rips parental freedom and the ability to raise their kids as they see fit. And I'm, I'm telling you right now, I'm the one that can attest to that. I've called the assembly. I've provided testimony. I believe what the assembly has tried to do has been very detrimental to the family. So you have, but if you read the appeal or you read other local blogs, you would not even know that. You would see that it's actually the residents and the citizens of Anchorage that are the problem. It's not Forrest Dunbar. It's us. It's the people. It's Save Anchorage. It's Recall Rivera. It's Reclaim Midtown. It's Reclaim Anchorage. It's Reclaim Alaska. It's whatever is out there. They're the problem. And you know why they're the problem? They're the problem because they're the resistance to that. They're the resistance to left-wing ideology. They're the resistance and the stumbling block for Forrest to get his very left-leaning agenda out there. They are the resistance to that. And whenever there's resistance, it's demonized. And that's what's happening right now. And now it's a coordinated effort. Now you have people in San Francisco at the appeal, which is, again, it's a well-funded, left-leaning uh, online media site who are calling people in Anchorage and encouraging them to uh, read this, to look at this, to try to get this out, to show, quote-unquote, that not only is Save Anchorage a terrible place, but your two conservative candidates for mayor are a part of this group, and they're it. 
And not only that, you have people in that group that have stormed the Capitol, or you have people in that group who have done heinous things. And listen, anybody, if, if those accusations, if accusations of people within the group are true, then yes, there are heinous and gross. But you don't categorize an entire population based on an individual's decision-making. That's a dangerous road. And I guarantee you, those who are making that claim would not like that placed upon them. Trust me. Do you want me to accuse every outlet and every lobbying group and every group that, that, that campaigns against conservatives? That much like the Lincoln Project that had an incredible amount of issue with sexual misconduct that all of them do? I don't think a lot of people would like that. I don't think a lot of people would like that. I, I certainly don't like that. But you know what? You could sling mud if everything you do on the other end is, is categorized as uh, the person's another person's fault. Blame shifting is an incredible ability of the left right now. It really is. Well, uh, let's move on here. We'll get back to Forrest in a minute. Uh, an NTSB report, okay? An NTSB report on the helicopter crash of Andy Tuber came out. And there's some really interesting things I want to talk about. First of all, the National Transportation Safety Board uh, report indicates that Tuber's crash, and I'm reading this from the article on Must Read Alaska, uh, indicates that Tuber was rushed and probably tired. Well, why was he rushed and probably untired? Well, here's what the report actually says verbatim, and I quote, he, another pilot from Kodiak Helicopters, commented to the hel Kodiak Helicopter pilot that he wanted, okay, this is Andy Tuber, to be in Kodiak with his family when a local news story involving him was scheduled to be published. Now, why is that important? Well, again, the article that Suzanne Downing wrote, and if you want to read the entire report, uh, article. It's under NTSB report. Andy Tuber was distraught over pending ADN story before helicopter crash or heli crash. crash. Here's why that's important in, in Suzanne writes. It's a rare day when the NTSB makes mention that a newspaper event may have prompted an accident. The wording is careful. The implication is clear. Andy Tuber was not in his right mind to pilot his helicopter to Kodiak. So, I'm going to be very careful when I talk about this. I'm going to be very careful. Because unlike some political ideologies, I think there are two sides to a coin. And what I mean by that is, if you start going in on newspapers about writing reports and about people being just, you know, not really liking them, and then... A conservative outlet does the same. You can't, you can't, you have to be careful on this. And as I'm saying this right now, there, there's just a lot to think about. But I'm just going to talk to you about some of the things that are interesting. And I'm going to ask, just ask questions at this point. So there are allegations made by a female employee of Andy Tuber. Now, there's a couple things to note here. Number one is the ADN did ask Andy a bunch of questions and that's also up on the must read alaska we must read alaska was able to obtain those questions and answers from andy tuber and in those questions andy did admit to having a consensual relationship he also admitted that there were a lot of things he couldn't talk about based on a uh legal confidentiality agreement he had with his employer former employer antHC now, the problem with that is, is that legally he's bound to not say a word on certain subjects. But he did refute the allegations and said he had actual text messages to prove that what he was saying was true. The problem here is I don't know what the precipitous was for not waiting to see those text messages. Because, according to the report, that Evans 
would not show the text messages. His accuser. So now we have a bit of a problem. We just have a bit of a problem. And, and my question is, was every measure followed to ensure that the full story was provided? And that's the question I have for you. If Andy Tuber said he had text messages to corroborate his story that the relationship was consensual, wasn't forced, that, and I believe, if I'm remembering correctly, that Tuber actually said most of the initiation on those encounters between the two were initiated by the accuser, not by Tuber. But the problem is, is that the ADN could not get those text messages from the accuser, could not get the text, well, didn't give, it sounds like, Tuber enough time to actually get them the text messages. And so, unbeknownst to <clears throat> anybody except for Tuber at the time, probably because the ADN had said, we're going to run with the story, he was out of state, getting married, wanted to rush back to be uh, with family, as it says in the article, because they wanted to be there when the story dropped. And now there's a gentleman who didn't make it to Kodiak, who crashed, who, in regards to this report, shows was flying in excess of the recommended speed. In the, in the actual report, was commented that he was trying to get home to his family in Kodiak before a local news story involving him was published. So all this is on the record now. All this is within the report. And here's the other thing. And here's why I'm taking for it. I'm, I'm really trying to be careful here. But here we go. Some other interesting things. And this is from Suzanne's article here. Even the Anchorage Daily News story on the NTSB report indicates that the rush to print their story was a possible contributing factor to Tuber's death. That's a big claim. That is a very big claim for an NTSB report to, to, to actually put out there. Quote, the helicopter company pilot told investigators that Tuber said he was trying to fly from Merrill Field in Anchorage to Kodiak to be with family, the report said. The ADN reported. Quote, the story published later that day by the Anchorage Daily News and ProPublica Pro Publica, detailed allegations of harassment and sexual misconduct made in a February 23 resignation letter to N uh, ANTHC board from a former assistant, including accusations he, this is Tuber, unrelentingly coerced, forced, and required sex of her, the newspaper reported. And again, Tuber disputed those claims. And I believe in, in the previous um, article written on uh, Must Read Alaska, he even said that a, a lot of those encounters were initiated by the accuser. So now where do we go from here? You know, it almost feels like news cycles happen so quickly that we forget about things and not a lot of questions are asked. And now, uh, you know, a family is, is left heartbroken. Um, there's still questions to remain as to what really happened uh, within that relationship. Who's telling the truth? Who's not? And, and I don't know if we're going to get answers from that. But the N NTSB report has a lot of interesting uh, uh, facts that have been have been officially put into record. So we'll see where that goes from there. But again, a tragic story. Uh, unfortunately, I don't know if we're going to get any answers or any truth out of what truly happened. And any time an allegation like that is brought forth, you need to take it seriously. Um, and now you have an individual who who has passed away is not able to share their side of the story. You have a woman who who has uh, allegations of of being forced to do things and coerced uh, that, if true, are are absolutely disgusting. And so you just have this you have this real issue now of just a lot of questions left unanswered. 
And now you have this report that details out uh, pretty clearly that Tuber was flying home um, what appeared to be tired and emotionally distraught because, and, and again, it's directly linked to a article that was going to be published by the Anchorage Daily News. So I don't know what's going to happen to that, but man, what a what a terrible story all around, and and hopefully we get some clarity down the road um, for both sides because that is just um, again it's just an un, un, unfortunate and, and really sad story uh, and tragedy really more than anything else. So as we come to a close here, I, I want to wrap up a couple of things. As you probably told that last that last story, it was hard for me to to really dive in. I want to be very careful in how I approach that because as as people that report stories, as people that talk about news and maybe even break news from time to time, uh, whether it's written or, or on this podcast, you got to be careful because, again, I don't want to be like the individuals who I find just absolutely out of taste where they, you know, whether it's outlets or individuals specifically that go after people for X, Y, or Z and then do it themselves. I'm not a do as I say not as I do guy. I want to be very careful in how we we report things and also how we describe and explain and work through stuff. And with, you know, Andy Tuber and the ADN article and all that, I just want to be careful because we are, you know, a blog, but we are a news outlet and we provide a lot of great information to our readers and listeners and our supporters. And I don't want to be accused of the same thing that I'm accusing others of or just generally speaking, don't want to be a hypocrite, per se. So I just want to leave you with those questions. You know, what? where do we go from here? How do we How do we sort through uh, this particular tragedy? And, and can we find the truth? Is the truth actually findable at this point because of what's happened? You know, and, and yeah, that's just, you know, a really tough thing and really difficult questions to move forward because all around... There's just a lot of tragedy that has occurred in this one particular incident and story. So uh, as we close, let's just talk about this. Um, there has been a real push, as we talked about, by the Dunbar campaign on a lot of fronts. And clearly, Forrest has made it known that he believes it's going to be him and Dave Bronson in the runoff. And, and polling has showed that same thing, that Dave and, and Forrest are neck and neck when it comes to percentage of votes in the initial um, mayor candidate, uh, the initial balloting. So now it begs the question, you know, what happens next? And I, and I just want to take a, a quick minute. We started it at the top of the show, and I'm going to end it like this. I'm imploring everybody that if there is a runoff and that there is an opportunity to vote again, to vote and specifically, I'm talking to conservatives because statistically, the drop in voting for a runoff is massive. It's huge. And remember, it's a percentage of the vote that dictates mayor. It's not total vote. So listen, I'm imploring every person out there that voted the first time around to vote again and to vote, vote and vote. Do not stop. I cannot tell you enough how important this is going to be long term because if you do not, there is going to be major ramifications. Major ramifications for that. So I'm imploring everybody, if you voted this week or are going to vote before the deadline in April and there is a runoff, vote again. Do not dismiss it. Do not say this doesn't work. Do not say X, Y, and Z. It doesn't matter. Your vote does matter. And if you want to see Anchorage changed, if you do not like the direction Anchorage is going, and if you want to see Anchorage changed, turned around, policies that you agree with, do not stop voting. It's not over. It's not over until it's over. And that means you have to vote. So again, I know that I've said it at the top of the show, and I'll say it again. Vote, vote, vote. Do not stop until a candidate is elected. Well, that's it for me this week. Listen, thank you for joining me. 
Make sure you check us out on mustreadalaska.com. And if you want to support what we do, go to mustreadalaska.com and go to the top right to the donate side and, and donate to Must Read Alaska. It helps us continue putting out great content. I want to thank Suzanne Downing and John Quick, incredible people to work with. And if you want to find us on any kind of platform, whether it's uh, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Rumble, MeWe, Parlor, you can find us all on those platforms, and it's usually under the same handle, which is Must Read Alaska, all one word. Go check us out. You'll find great content, video content, the works. And uh, as always, you can find all of our articles on mustreadalaska.com. Well, that's it for me this week. Uh, until next week, we'll see you then. <laughs>